We are almost to the new year and it is time to get the freezer in this outside shed emptied. Can we? Once again, I'm starting this video very similar to previous videos. We're out in the shed checking the freezer, but this time I'm actually taking stuff out of the fourth freezer. That's exciting. So we're starting off this week tackling all the tomatoes that are in here. Now, unfortunately, all those tomatoes are at the bottom, so we have to empty everything out, but that'll give us an idea of what's actually in here. We've removed all the lamb and gotten that out of here for the moment. It's sitting on the lawn, but we're getting these tomatoes out. There's a few other things in here, but the majority of it on the bottom here is tomatoes. And this week we're going to be making butter chicken curry sauce and some more ketchup. So that's gonna use a huge portion of these. So in the last few weeks of this freezer challenge, we have used a lot of ground lamb and a lot of lamb bones. But as you've seen, we do use a lot of lamb around here because that is a main item that we grow on the homestead. And here we have two more sheep that we uh, had butchered a month ago now, and they've been out in this freezer so that we use up the old stuff first. But again, I'm storing bones. All right, so you just saw us take all those tomatoes out of the freezer. That was 48 pounds. And our plan with those is to make 24 pounds into ketchup and 24 pounds into butter chicken curry sauce. So we are starting with the ketchup. I'm using the Bernadine tomato canning recipe book. I love this one. It's my go-to for a lot of tomato recipes. And we're basically just following the recipe in there. I do have a video for this, which I will link above. So if you want a little bit more detail on how to make this ketchup, go and check out that video. We're gonna kind of just whip through the process here because the idea is to get going and get more stuff out of the freezer. Now, one thing I am going to admit is we are not going to achieve our goal of having everything out of the freezer by the 1st of January. The holidays have set us back big time and not in a bad way because we love holidays and everything that comes with that, but it has certainly set back the progress we were making on these freezers. So in a few moments, Chris is going to show you one of my favorite tools in a preserving kitchen, but we're not going to talk too much about that yet. Where we're going to start is talking about tomato prep. All of my sauces, ketchup, curry, pasta sauce, all of them, I freeze the tomatoes first. Six pounds in a bag, freeze it, and that way when it thaws out, all that liquid, you can drain it off before you even process that into your paste and it saves so much time. I'm talking hours off of your cook down time, which is fantastic when you're trying to pump some stuff out in the kitchen. So remember that and give it a try. Freeze them up first. And yes, freezer space is a premium, but this process is worth it. So Chris is hard at work using our juicer. This is a very old Victorio juicer that I love and use religiously oh my goodness but what i want a lot <laughs> a lot applesauce all tomato products so much stuff fruit paste all of it so much goes through this juicer and it is fantastic but one thing i want to point out here is look at how thick this sauce is coming through this juicer absolutely beautiful takes out all the seeds everything and we're left with this nice thick pulp after draining all that liquid out but one thing I will say is have no fear. I did keep a good portion of the liquid. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do with it yet, but we'll come up with some sort of soup or something next week to use this up. So before Chris puts this first container into our pot, I just wanted to mention I've got all the spices, cinnamon sticks, everything, all the goodies in this little spice bag. Just tighten a knot and throw it in. And that's going to sit in there the whole time that this simmers down. Almost looks like ketchup already. All right, well, we've got the ketchup well underway. And the next thing to do is take this 24 pounds of tomatoes that we took out of the freezer. We're gonna do the exact same thing, grind them up with the uh, juicer here. And then tomorrow, because we don't have enough uh, space on the oven, tomorrow we're gonna make butter chicken curry sauce. So uh, that's gonna be its own recipe, but it's still coming from uh, what we took out of the freezer. So as I'm working away here on the ketchup, I had a thought I wanted to share with you. One thing that makes it a lot easier to get all the ketchup-y tomato product off your spice bag is to put it in your apple cider vinegar 
swoosh it around, swirl it around and clean it off before you put your cider vinegar into the uh, ketchup because then you've got a nice clean spice bag and nothing wasted, right? And the other tip that I want to mention, and this is something that I started doing because my kids wanted squeezy bottle ketchup. They didn't want chunky ketchup. Use an immersion blender before you add your vinegar, sugar, and salt, and uh, really work up those onions and tomatoes to make a real smooth, thick paste. Just basically, nothing to it. All right, guys, it is time to make that butter chicken sauce to use up the rest of these tomatoes that have been thawing for ages and are certainly good to go. Chris last night processed them all through the juicer so that we didn't have to clean it and then get it dirty again today. And now we're gonna put all this together, but guess what? I'm gonna hold you in suspense because coming up after this video is a recipe video for this butter chicken curry sauce. So. If that is something you're interested in knowing a bit more details on, be sure to take a look at that recipe and let me know what you think if you try it out. All right, guys, well, we uh, got our butter chicken sauce all ready to go. We've just got to jar it up and I am doing the taste test. And I've mixed this with a little bit of yogurt, not coconut milk, but a little bit of yogurt. It's pretty good. It is pretty good stuff. So we're going to get this jarred up and we'll see how many jars we got. And then finally, we'll be done kind of what we want to do at least with tomatoes for this uh, video. So as you saw in our most recent freezer challenge video, I do think we are making really good progress. I mean, I am actually really surprised how much food is actually in these freezers. I don't think I even had any notion of how much food we actually had stocked away. So I know this doesn't look much different than it did a month ago. But trust me, I think it is coming along. <laughs> trust me. But we're going to dig in here again and get out some meat. You saw this freezer on the last one, our fruit and lamb freezer. You can see all of our containers of cat food. I'm actually going to take one of those out right now because we need one for today to feed the cats. And buried back in here, I'm stuck doing the thing that I hate the most, moving everything once again to get at the stuff at the bottom. We're going to take out eight roasts. We really like the loin roast for the jerky, so we're going to take out the two loin roasts for that, and then hopefully get a bunch of leg roasts out to chop up the meat. Unfortunately, I didn't do the smartest thing when I stacked all this back in here. I put all the nice loin roasts on top, and all the leg roasts are on the bottom. So I'm going to take some subscribers' advice in the, that I received in the comments on the last video, and I'm going to bag these loins into super supermarket bags. That way, it's easy for me just to take them out and get at the stuff at the bottom. I'm suffering from a strange sense of deja vu that I've done this before. We have removed nine roasts in total. And what we're left with, which I'll show you in one second here, or I'll splice it over even better, is... At the bottom, we have 12 leg roasts, and in the bag, we have 16 loin roasts. So we still have 28 roasts in the freezer, even after removing the nine. So next, we need to remove 11 pounds of our ground lamb in order to make our chili meat. The recipe actually is for 10 pounds, but I always add an extra pound because I do find sometimes the butcher isn't perfectly right on with the uh, one pound in each packet. And a little extra doesn't hurt, really. So that's the next step, which, You'll know from the previous video, we have 21 pounds right here in our uh, milk crate. So we're going to be emptying pretty much half of that. Removing all these loin roasts for the moment. I've reached our first leg of lamb. So we're going to re remove that. Even though this one's older, I think I'm gonna leave it in because it's vacuum sealed. It is time to get going on using up all this meat that we've taken out of the freezer. Now we did that two days ago. Our roasts are all unthawed, our meat is all unthawed, and it's time to kick it into full gear. So we're gonna start off with our chili meat. Now one thing for me with chili meat is I don't can it with the beans in. I can the beans separate and we just put a bunch of jars together when we wanna make chili. I find it so much more convenient because then I can use the meat for something else if I want 
and the beans for something else that if I want and it all works and everybody's happy. For this recipe I'm going to be using one of my all-time favorite canning books. This sucker, I mean you can tell it's worn, it's been used and loved and I feel that almost every recipe I've ever made out of this book is a winner. I really really do and uh, that's why I go back to this time and time again. So this is the one we're going to be using for our chili meat and it actually is for beef but of course as you know around here we use lamb. We substitute lamb for almost any beef recipe with no problems and why do we do that? That's because we raise sheep. Uh, if you're interested at all in following that content, you can check out our uh, sister channel, Life Raising Sheep. We'll put a link down in the description below in case anybody would like to see our journey with uh, raising sheep, both for meat and fleece. I digress again, as I always do. So let's get busy. First step is going to be getting this 10 pounds of meat into my big, big pot. And we're going to cook that down. Now, the recipe does say just to brown the meat, but I like to cook it right through because... Just like everything else around here we don't want to waste, I want to cook out that fat as much as possible before I add any spices because we drain that off and I use it as lard for cooking throughout the rest of the year. So we're going to start with that and then we're going to add everything else. All right, so our meat is all cooked up and you can see down here as I pull it to the side, we have a lot of fat and liquid in there. So I'm just going to use my ladle and take it out for now. Hopefully it's not more than two cups because I only took out my two cupper. But this is really handy later to use as lard for cooking potatoes and eggs and all that sort of stuff. There's also at this point a lot of water in this so I will be cooking it again in another saucepan before I store it. Alright so you can see there we've strained it all. It's pretty light and fluffy. That's what I like to see. When, like I said it's pretty much all cooked. Next is all the rest of our ingredients bunged in here. Four cups of onion, four cloves of garlic. It's actually only supposed to be two cloves of garlic and I'm actually lying to you because I put five because we like our garlic around here. One cup of chili powder. It seems like a lot, but believe me, it does make quite a bit. Three tablespoons of salt, two teaspoons of hot sauce. It does call for chopped up hot peppers, but I don't have that. I just use my hot sauce and I would imagine when it comes to the hot sauce, you can use whatever you like because it really is up to your taste buds. Two teaspoons of cumin. I'm going to kind of mix this around, turn it back on, and then we're going to add in our tomatoes. And it calls for three liters of diced tomatoes. I'm actually using one liter for now and one liter of my plain tomato juice. Using stuff out of the pantry, that's what it's all about. And I'm going to cook that for a little bit and then see if we actually need the extra liquid because I don't want it to be too runny. So that's it for now. We did add an extra half liter of tomato juice and I've kept the other half just in case I need to add it as this simmers. But we're gonna let it simmer for 20 minutes and in the jars it goes, then in the pressure canner it goes. So our simmering is over and it is time to jar this up. I'm going into 500 milliliter jars so we're gonna have to pressure can this for one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, if you were doing quart jars, it'd be one hour and 30 minutes or 90 minutes. But we prefer the 500 ml because sometimes it's just Chris and I eating and we don't need a big jar of meat open. So if we need that, we'll just open two. But anyways, I'm curious to see how many we get from this. I've got 12 jars and lids all ready to go. So fingers crossed we get at least the 12. We want to leave about that one inch head space on there. Finger tight for those jars. Basically that means you didn't wrench it on. You're just putting it on until it's tight and kind of wants to spin. And in the pressure canner, it's going to go. Awesome. We ended up with 14 500 ml jars, which is wonderful. Exactly what I was hoping for. More than I was hoping for, in fact. And now it's time to put our lid on. And yes, it's upside down at the moment. But what I'm doing here is I'm getting some olive oil onto my ring before I put it in there. It just prolongs the life of your gasket. We're going to bring that to 10 pounds of pressure. And it's going to go for an hour and 15 minutes. We've got our 14 jars out of the canner. They're still sort of bubbling away, but they all sealed beautifully, even with reusing my lids. I know you're not supposed to, but I do that anyways. Now it's time to slice up those two loin roasts we took out, and we're going to make our lamb jerk. We're not going to bore you with all these details again, because we already did that last week. We have all the meat cut up for our jerky, and we're just now getting the sauce organized. Now, I ended up deciding to only do one kind just to keep it simple because we still have quite a bit of the other one left. 
Granted, it is still disappearing. So we're doing a sweet heat recipe and I'm currently making teriyaki sauce from scratch because the recipe called for teriyaki sauce. And of course, I don't have that in the fridge, but that's okay. We had everything we needed to make it. So we're gonna do that. And while we are getting the sauce ready and marinating this meat overnight, we're not gonna cook this all night, but we are cooking down the lard and fat from the lamb meat that we just uh, sliced up. As you can see on those loins, there was quite a bit of it. So there's gonna be some chicken food that comes out of that, but uh, cooked down on a nice heat, this will create a lot of lard. And not only do we get the lard from that today, we also have uh, two cups almost from the chili meat and I've got them upside down. This is a trick a subscriber told me last year, I think actually in the pantry challenge, so that all the yucky stuff that you don't want to eat settles to the bottom. When you flip it over, you can very easily scrape it off and you're left with nice clean lard. So this is just for potatoes and things like that, but it works beautifully. Abby, are we about to cut some meat? Hey. Right? Apparently, it's time to cut some meat. We sharpen the knives and the cats are ready. <laughs> so we've made our 14 jars of chili meat. We've got our jerky meat all sliced up and that will be going on the dehydrator before bed tonight. And now it's time to cut up our meat and get it into jars so that we can pressure can it because we're getting some of these roasts out of the freezer as we already have mentioned. Now when we do this, I have two different jars. I have small mouth jars and wide mouth jars. And basically the reason I have that is because one jar is for human consumption and one jar is for cat food. I am very picky about my meat and what goes into my food. I know that is terrible, but it just comes with growing a lot of your own food and having surplus and something that can consume that. And so therefore I do split my meat up between cat food and human food. So that is where we're at right now. And I've enlisted Christopher to help me because this is a big job cutting up. I think we took out seven roasts. So we're going to get started. I'm not going to bore you with too much details, but we'll come back when these jars are filled up and we'll get it all canned. Are you starving cat again? Hmm? You're starving here. Can you get it? Can you get it? Oh, he's excited. Oh. Here's to give you a bit better idea of our process. Chris is cutting off stuff there. That's all for either chickens or cats. So this here would be kind of cat food meat for us. Things that are kind of sinewy, have skin on them, that sort of stuff you can see. On the flip side, there is our human grade meat. Very little in the way of extras in my mind but it always cooks up beautifully all right so we have them in their jars we ended up with nine for human grade and four for cats and now i'm just going to add a couple inches of water into each of these boiling water and then we're going to get them into the pressure canner and i know i will get comments on that i don't have to do this but this is just what i've always done so that's why i do it and once again, I am reusing lids. There we are. We've got our three liters of water in there and we're going to put the lid on and get this up to 10 pounds pressure. And uh, then it needs to cook, cook, can, whatever you want to call it, uh, for an hour and 15 minutes because we did pint jars. If you were doing quart jars, it would be an hour and 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. We do have a video on this process, which uh, we'll link above uh, if you want to check out the more in-depth canning process and recipe for this. Again, we're just kind of showing you what we're doing to empty out our freezers today. So while we're waiting on the canner to get to temperature, we're going to deal with this. What is this, you say? That is all of our fat meat chopped up from yesterday when we did the uh, jerky meat and we had all those bits that kind of look like bacon so we chopped it up we've cooked it down and what we're going to be left with is a beautiful oil that's going to go to a lard so we're going to now pour this into our jar it's been simmering for hours i was kind of hoping we were going to get something like a crackling look at that Woo! 
We do use actually a lot of lamb lard. So we just wanted to show how much lard we've gotten just from this week from what we've canned in lamb meat. It's absolutely wild. So these three were from the other day I'd shown you um, when we uh, did the taco meat. And that is from the jerky meat. And of course around here, waste not, want not. Chris is going to try and concoct this fatty, meaty mess into something delicious. Now I will admit, I just tried it. I'm not a fan of just eating a piece of fat. I mean, unless it's bacon and cooked up perfect and just wonderful. But the meat parts in here are actually really tasty. And I'm going to also say, this is why meal planning will not work for me for the pantry challenge. Because another thing we've thrown into the picture here, using leftovers, so we didn't have enough lamb to make one more jar for canning. So we threw that into the leftover teriyaki marinade from the beef. There you go again. From the lamb jerky that we made yesterday. And we're going to marinate that overnight. And that's going to be tomorrow night's dinner. So just spur of the moment. Who knows what's going to happen around here. It's crazy. Here we go with our little experiment. Basically lamb crackling for lack of a better way to put it. We've kind of fried it up with some onion and garlic and a little bit of spices. And to be honest, it doesn't actually look too bad. So I'm going to take it out and we'll give it a taste test. So we didn't film my first try. And it actually isn't bad. And Chris went to, he's like, oh, 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 and went to grab the camera. But I'll let Chris tell you when he comes to try it what he put in it. But I don't know if you can actually hear it. It's like, um, yes, crunchy. I did that. I just moved really close to the camera so you could hear me chew. But yeah, it's really crunchy on the outside and the fat has gone like a really, really nice, I've never had pork crackling, so I don't know, but I think they're crispy all the way through. And this is soft inside, but crunchy on the outside. Very interesting. Anyways, let's let Chris try. They're hot, but uh, yeah, they've gone really crispy on the outside. And uh, basically I use salt parsley, a little bit of Montreal steak spice, and uh, obviously the garlic and the onions. So let's try it. Oh, I can hear you crunching. That's pretty good. Oh, you're glowing. <laughs> I should not say only, like... Not only did we make the, the jerky out of it, get the oil, but we actually are going to have dinner as well. Not too shabby. It doesn't look pretty, but it tastes really good. It's like popcorn lamb. That's exactly what it is. It's like a popcorn chicken or a popcorn whatever. Popcorn lamb. Perfect. Love it. Well, we've just finished that wonderful dinner and now Chris is hard at work getting our lamb jerky all onto the dehydrator. You said it right. I did. I almost did. You hear me kind of do a little like pause. I hesitated for a second. I had to really think. But anyways, like I said, we've done like a sweet heat teriyaki combinations so just a very quick update on the jerky we got it all finished the second round here i did like a teriyaki flavoring it's all right so we'll do another test test on this one here but one thing i did notice is it's very important to make sure you have enough marinade on these it's uh some pieces have really really good flavor and then other pieces just taste like dried out lamb so learning curve on that didn't get quite as much from this one, although we didn't weigh it and we have been snacking. So maybe we did and I just didn't realize it. <laughs> Jerky has really become a popular snacking item around here. So spread out in front of me here is the last week and a half's efforts of emptying the freezer. And no, we are not there yet. As you can see from this little clip, the freezer out there is about half empty. Now saying that there's some spots inside, we could probably move that stuff in, but I'm not ready to yet because I want to use more of the old stuff first. But we managed to make butter chicken, ketchup, chili meat, and canned lamb. And not to mention our jerky. So all in all, this is just stuff that's going right onto the pantry shelves to keep us fed all winter long and working towards our goal of emptying the freezer. So stay tuned because this freezer challenge is going to keep going because I do want to achieve emptying that outside freezer. So we will keep tackling this and keep making stuff and keep bringing you guys along for the ride.